joining us for this session, I have been delight, surprised and delighted at the, um, at the amount of, uh, of positive response and interest uh, that we've had in this particular session. A um, little bit of background, uh, my dear beloved sister, Sophia the Orange, uh, out in Atlantia, kind of twisted my arm and said, hey, don't you have this class on how to, how to make a class, how to create your own class so, so people can teach things? Uh, and I said, well, no, I, I ran it once at Penzik and, and I, I saw an Ared, uh pop up in the video. So hello, welcome. This is, this is what the class has become. Um, I did teach this once at Penzik and realized I had bitten off way too much to fit into one hour at, at a Penzik session. So, so this is about the fourth revision. Fourth revision. We've been uh, uh, tweaking it a whole lot, and uh, I'm excited. And I hope you all get what you want out of it. Um, there are PowerPoint slides. There are also a number of uh, templates and a worksheet. Uh, I have these available on a Google Drive, and I will post it towards the end of the class. Uh, that's one of the things that I have not done. Oops. Uh, before we get started here. I have the link. I just need to copy it because there's no way of remembering that whole uh, string. Hey, of you want me to do that? Oh, hi, Sophie. Yes, please. This is Sophie, <laughs> my my beloved uh, shenaniganator uh, in arms, uh, comrade in arms, and uh, she's she's got the stuff. So yes, if you could pretty please post right. that in the chat, I would be grateful. Very I'll do that, and I won't interrupt anymore, I promise. Go for it. <laughs> All right, so how to create a class from what you already know. Uh, I spent about 10 years working for the Girl Scouts, uh, our local council, in adult development, and one of the big things that I did was teach classes. I got to teach Girl Scout leaders how to be Girl Scout leaders and how to build campfires and how to plan campouts and how to uh, make it a girl focused troop and how to handle conflicts and all sorts of fantastic stuff. Uh, so I got to teach a lot of people a lot of things. I also got to teach people how to teach things and I got to teach people how to teach people how to teach things so running the uh, train the trainer course and the instructor of trainers courses was really interesting and really stretched my brain a lot uh, and we had some very specific formats some sp specific templates some specific designs of what we uh, used how we wanted to standardize things uh, in the SCA uh, we're a little more loosey goosey, and that's okay because I started looking at things. It was one of the, it, it was a little um, a, a little mind blowing to realize that oh, Chia, you've been doing this for ten years, probably longer. Not everybody can just walk in, take a pile of of pictures and references, and make a class out of it. So here, let's use these Girl Scout skills. Let's use this Girl Scout knowledge. And, and do something with it, share it with the known world. Uh, so what I've got for you today is we're gonna talk about, um, ah, let me, ah, ah. We're gonna talk about a couple of main topics. First off is something we call the Addy cycle. It's a framework for how to organize your thoughts, how to put things together. We're gonna talk about some SMART goals because SMART goals are the heart of everything. I'm going to show you a worksheet uh, that I've developed specifically for this group to use to put together your own class. And then I'm going to show you uh, three different templates that we use for the specific content uh, to use in the worksheet. And again, these are all going to be available on the wonderful link that Sophie is putting up for us. First off, the Addy cycle. This has several parts. The first one is to analyze, then design, then develop, then implement, and finally to evaluate. Going into a little more detail, analyze is when we, we start doing the thinking, come up with a big idea, 
what is it that you want to create? What is it that you have that would make a good class? Now, this can go from two directions. Um, I've had some people say, you know, there's there's a need here. Every time I go to the uh, every time I start running gate for my local group for an event, people cannot figure out the cash box. So I want to teach a class on how to set up the cash box or how to run gates so people know how to do this, so people can consistently do this over and over again. That's an excellent reason to do a class. Uh, on the opposite side, and I'm going to borrow my beloved assistant Sophie for this, uh, Sophie went to a really amazing workshop in England. Uh, I want to say the name wrong, but she went to an amazing workshop in England. Uh, it, was it, it, it's Graham. Yeah, Barry Grantham. Barry uh, it was Grantham. a media workshop called the Calamie Easter School, and I had uh -huh. lots of fun learning Comedia from people in England. Yes. Yes, and it was amazing. And she came back and she was so excited and she had to, she wanted to share this. So she came up with several ideas of classes to do out of the thing that she had learned that she wanted to share. So you can come at it from this direction, you can come at it from that direction of what are the needs or what do I have that I want to share. But the analysis is a big part of it. Think about what would make a good class. Uh, the next section we have is design. If you were a costumer, this is where you'd get out your pencils and large sheets of paper and, and start sketching the big ideas, the big concept. Uh, what is it that you want to cover? Are there any limitations that you have to have in mind? Uh, when I was creating this class, the very first time I was going to be teaching at Penzik, which we mo most of us know does not have electricity handy, does not have computers handy. So the idea of being able to do this with PowerPoint slides had not occurred to me at all. But I have lots and lots of things on pieces of paper that I like to give to students in my classes. So that's the kind of that's the kind of thing that you might want to consider is how are you going to do your presentation and one that I have run into many times, especially for this session. How much can you fit in an hour. Uh, one of the things that my beloved mentor Bev at the Girl Scout office used to say is I will promise you three things we'll have fun. We'll learn stuff and we will run out of time. And I have found over the course of many, many years, that is absolutely true. We almost always run out of time, uh, even in the classes I've taught three dozen times. Uh, but that's part of the design. That's part of our big sketch uh, of starting to put our arms around, starting to get our brain wrapped around the big design. What do we want to create? Uh, part three out of Addy is develop. This is where you start putting things together. If you've decided you're going to write power, if you're decided you're going to do your presentation with PowerPoint slides, this is where you start writing your PowerPoint slides. If you're going to have some paper handouts, this is where you write your paper handouts. If you're going to have an activity, this is where you create the activity, whether it's from scratch, uh, do you have to develop a game? Do you have to write uh, a script? Uh, anything you want, this is where you go from your idea to reality, ready to go into your classroom. Uh, and the last line I've mentioned here, uh, you might want to choose one of the framework templates, and we'll get to those in a bit. Uh, okay, step four, we've got analyze, design, uh, develop, Implement. Implement is where you do you where you do the thing. I am implementing right now. We have the class that I've put together, and I am delivering it to you. Uh, as a note, uh, especially if you're new to the process, it really really helps to have an extra person there, like I have Sophie, to be moral support and to take notes as you go and to handle things that might. <laughs> Love you, sister. Uh, handle things that might go a little bit off the rails. Uh, so, so for instance, if one of the things that happened, I was teaching a class, there was a severe thunderstorm, the power went out. 
the lights went out. Having someone else there in the room to take care of going and finding out how to get the power back on so I could continue teaching, that was really valuable. Uh, also, it's a good idea just to have another set of eyes, another brain focused on this to offer feedback later, uh, because I can't remember every single thing I've said during a one hour session or especially a two hour session like tonight. So it's really valuable to have somebody else that's also devoting a couple of brain cells to this. Um, if you don't have um, if you're not so lucky to have a Sophia in your life like I am, uh, you can take a few notes. It's one of the things I uh, let the uh, let the participants know ahead of time. Yes, I'm going to be taking some notes so we can improve the class and I'd love your feedback later. Feedback. Haha. -ha. This is important in stage five of Addy, which is evaluate what went well, what didn't. Get feedback from others, but also get feedback from yourself. How did I feel doing this? Did I feel that my flow, that my main bullet points, that the structure of the class, did that go well or did it not? Is this something I might want to change? Uh, getting important uh, feedback from other people. Did this cover what you needed it to cover? Uh, does it match what was advertised in the Pensac class book? Does it match the uh, what was mentioned online? D does it match the class description that uh, Erum put up? Um, are there big gaps? Is there something that uh, is there something that we missed? Do I find, here's a good one, do I find through the course of teaching several classes that there are people asking the same questions over and over? And then the brilliant thing is once you've done your evaluation, ha ha, we analyze again. What is it that we want to change? Uh, it's a cycle. It goes around and around and around. We love cycles. So every time you teach, Think about what happened, what went on, and decide from there, decide from your own evaluation, uh, analyze what you want to change. It may be that it turned out perfect and you're perfectly happy with it. So keep it that way. But always, anytime you teach the class, anytime you implement, do evaluate. Uh, I will say that's one of the things that surprised me a little bit. My first couple of experiences at teaching at Pensick is they don't really do teacher evaluations. Uh, I, and that's probably because this is a very informal teaching environment. Um, but feel free to do your own evaluations. Talk to people afterwards. And I am going to give you a bit of a teaser. Uh, I do want to keep in touch with all of you here tonight because I'm so excited about this class concept so that at the very end, you'll have my uh, Facebook contacts and my email. So uh, if you do any of this, if you run through the worksheet, if you design a class, I want to know about it. I would love to discuss it with you. Tweak some stuff if you want. I can give you feedback or I can give you just lots and lots of encouragement. Uh, so um, sorry. Let me get back to my uh, notes here. Um, this is the Addy cycle. Uh, and this is, this is how to uh, create a thing and evaluate it and improve it. So that's, that's the Addy cycle. Uh, the next part, we're going to take kind of a step to the side and talk about SMART goals. Now, this may have come up in things like uh, planning your life future or uh, a lot of uh, employment performance, uh, performance evaluations will involve SMART goals. SMART goals are also a really, really, really good starting point for designing a class session. We always have these in Girl Scouts. And like Addy, it's a five-part acronym. We start with specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and timeline. So the first one, specific. Oh no, I didn't fix it. Okay, you may notice over on the uh, left hand side of the of the screen, it still says Addy cycle. That's a typo. Uh, <laughs> I, I evaluated, I figured that out in the last session and I forgot to fix it, but this is still SMART goals. Okay, specific. Uh, when you're working on a goal, when you're when you're setting a goal, narrow it down to what is important. 
Uh, and beware of scope creep. When you start with one thing, it can easily balloon to another and another and another. I know Sophie wanted to share everything uh, out of her Commedia class, and she managed to chop it down to enough pieces that she could do three separate classes and could fit it, fit it in what she had available. So, so to be specific, not to say, hey, I want it to be 20% cooler. You might want it to be 20% cooler, but that's a little fuzzy of, of a goal. Second part is that it should be measurable. Something that you can check the box and say yes or no. Did they do it or not? Uh, it should be objective rather than subjective. Uh, we want this to be something that uh, you can you can look at and say specific say specifically <laughs> have they managed this or not uh, achievable what can you really do in the time available this is another hang up for a lot of us in the SCA because we get this great idea of we want to be able to do this in a class at Penzik but really with the time available and sometimes with the skills that uh, that uh, people are able to develop in a one hour session. Usually it's a one hour session. Sometimes we have a little longer. Uh, but what can you really do in the time available? Is it reasonable to have a, a major mind shift of understanding uh, within just one class? Eh, maybe not. Uh, so, so the examples I have here, can you weave a yard of ankle trim? Probably not. You might have a person that really, really gets it and you're sailing along with no problems. Uh, someone might be able to weave a whole yard in, in the very first session. Warp an ink loom to get it set up, get your pattern started. That's a lot more likely. Uh, it may depend on, on the skills that your particular students have and things like, do they all have the materials? Do they all have a loom? Do they all have an idea in mind? Some of them may simply get so stuck on the idea that they never get to the physically warping part. Uh, and the last one, can they draft an ankle pattern? That is absolutely achievable in a class setting, does not need a whole lot of new skills to be developed or refined, does not need a whole lot of materials. Drafting is something that we can absolutely achieve in a class session. Uh, okay, smart, specific, measurable, achievable. R is for relevant. <laughs> yes, Star Wars reference. Are these the droids you're looking for? This is something that comes up in the SCA uh, because according to Kapora, we study history from 1600 and earlier. So keep in mind when you're, ooh, um, sorry, that was a note from my computer. Uh, keep that in mind as you're planning your class. Uh, I did think about this quite a bit when I was developing this class because all of this stuff that we're talking about was pretty much developed in the 1950s to 1970s. Uh, all the adult learning theory, all of the big names like Malcolm Nowles and David Kolb, uh, all of this came out in certainly less than the last hundred years. So is this relevant to what we do in the SCA? And I thought about it for a long time and decided, yes, it is, because this is a framework for delivering the content that we want within the SCA. So using these tools, we can do anything we want within the SCA period, within the SCA picture. So this is simply a piece, a tool for you to, you to use, just like Zoom, just like so many other tools that we have at our disposal. Uh, it feels a little separated because it is so modern and so technology related, but uh, the focus is the content that you yourself are going to be developing and sharing. So in that case, I give myself the thumbs up and say, yes, full speed ahead. Uh, okay, so oh, I have to click back on this window. There we go. All right, the last one is timeline or timely or time bound. If you go out and look for this on the internet, you get a lot of different variations, but the important piece is time, just plain 
time. What is the time frame? How much time are we going to use? When we break it out into sections, how much time is it going to take? Is this a one session class? Is this multiple pieces classes? Uh, does this need to be done in teeny tiny chunks or take up a whole day? Figure out the time that's available. Uh, let's see. So that takes us to the whole thing together. This one here is an example of a SMART goal. This is one of the goals that I created for this specific class. By the end of this session, students will recognize the five steps of the ADDI cycle. So you'll, you'll notice that we start off with time. By the end of the session, students will. Uh, and uh, there's a, uh, there's a uh, what's it called? Um, acronym. Uh, there's an acronym uh, that I can't spell when I'm not looking at it. But there's an acronym uh, B-T-E-O-T-S. PW. By the end of this session, participants will. We use that as shorthand in the Girl Scouts because we used it so many times. Uh, okay, so that's our time piece. Uh, students will recognize uh, that is the, um, that's the measurable, that, that's the specific part that students will recognize. It's also measurable, will they or won't they? Uh, the five steps of the ADDI cycle, that is the specific part that we're talking about the ADDI cycle. It is relevant because this is a course on, this, this is a class session on class design. So the ADDI cycle is a significant portion of that uh, and it's, measure, it's uh, achievable. So we're going to talk about we actually have already. We have talked about the ADDI ad cycle, and I'm pretty sure that since I, I haven't had any um, uh, an, anybody uh, freak out and leave the class, that you've all absorbed the ADDI cycle. You could at least recognize it when it comes up again. Uh, all right, let's see if we could do this. Uh, I usually like to have interactive activities. It's a little more challenging on Zoom because this is new for me. Uh, but here is a goal that we know is not smart. Would anyone like to take a stab at identifying part of it that is not smart and making it smart instead? Uh, and I think to do this, I need to go over here and uh, tell you what, go ahead and and wave, turn on your camera and wave so I can uh, see you. Oh, oh, okay. I, I see Tamlin and Elizabeth. Tell you what, let's go with Tamlin first. Tamlin, why don't you go ahead and unmute yourself and then give us, give us one element of something that you can make more smart in this goal. Um, there's no time frame for it or timeliness. Ding, ding, ding. Correct. So what would you put in here instead? Uh, add on by the end of this session. Ta-da! It's that simple. Isn't that great? Thank you, Tamlin. All right. Now, I, I see Elizabeth was up there as well, and she was waving. Elizabeth, do you want to unmute yourself, and do, do you have another one that you could add here? No, that was the one I went to right away. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, let, me, let me scroll through my pictures. Uh, anybody else want to wanna wave? Uh, okay, well, I'll go ahead and fill in uh, that uh, Tamlin was correct. We did not have a timeliness piece, so uh, we will uh, we'll add by the end of the session to the, to the front or the back of this. Uh, students will know that's a little challenging. Uh, I would not call that measurable because that assumes that it doesn't have any feedback. Uh, one of the easiest ways to make this measurable is to, to give it a number uh, and give it an action item to say students will write instead of know how to write. We will ask them to write one. So that's something we can look at. That's something I can touch. I can look at and find out, have they written a goal? Have they not? Are they drawing little pictures? That might be more fun. But uh, okay, so to make it measurable, uh, it is specific. 
we're talking about SMART goals. It's achievable. We're just asking to write one goal and put it in there. And uh, is it relevant? Yes, it's relevant because it relates to this particular session we're doing. All right, so I'm hoping that that makes, um, I'm hoping that makes sense for everybody. Bonus round. We're not going to stop and do it right now, but if you would like, I would challenge all of you to write a SMART goal. Sometime later tonight when we're done with the class, write a SMART goal. And like I said, I'm going to give you my email address. You can send it to me and I'll check it and give you the thumbs up. Uh, all right, pause for questions. Here's another opportunity. Uh, we've covered Addy, we've covered SMART, we've covered the plan for the class. Does anyone have any questions about anything that we've covered so far? Um, if you do, like I said before, please turn on your, your video and, and wave so, so I can see that you've got a question. And here's Tamlin again. Go ahead, okay, Tamlin. Late. Did you put a handout in the chat? Oh, uh, not yet. That's going to come. At, well, actually, I should I should revise. Um, there is a Google Drive that will have the class notes, all of these slides, the worksheet and the template. And my my dear darling TA, Sophie, my sister, uh, is going to be posting that. I'm not sure if she has posted it in the chat chat or she will be posting it in the chat, but it is out there. And actually, I might take a moment. And Sophie, if you're there. Yeah, it's there. I put okay. it in the chat. Yeah, okay, I put it in the so chat. And I'd like to also invite Andreas um, to include that in the Facebook event um, post, because I don't think I have edit rights for that. So go ahead and uh, share that free and clear anywhere you need to. It's a Google Drive that's set to anybody who has the link can download the files. Fantastic. Thank you, Sophie. Thank You're you, welcome. Sophie. And this is another reason why I love having a, <laughs> a co-conspirator uh, in my class. Sophie, you read my mind. <laughs> okay. So uh, did, did anybody else have a question? I, I thought I might see Tom Tommaso. Good to see you, Amico. You too. So one of the things I teach is bread. And oh. the way the way you the way I teach bread is we mix, we knead, we talk about bread while we're waiting for things to hydrolyze. And then we send everybody away for an hour while things ferment. And hopefully everybody remembers to, to come back. <laughs> <laughs> you might not see the fighters again, but you, you'll, the ANS types you'll see again. So is there a way to apply, should I be applying the SMART goals to each session to the whole thing or you know here's what I want to do for this I'm not even sure if I'm on camera <laughs> here's what I want to do for the session versus and, and then here's what I want to do for each section oh I would I would totally use it for the overall picture of the smart goals because what you're doing with breaking it into smaller pieces is you're breaking it into action steps so so as each one of those well sorry We'll get into some of the templates later. Each one of those parts, the the mixing the bread, the taking a pause to let it hydrolyze, talking about the chemistry of it, uh, and then the actual coming back and baking it later. Uh, those all can be their own separate pieces. They don't have to have a separate goal. The one, go the big goal is to help in the design and development and to wrap your brain around it. So breaking it into smaller parts is absolutely fantastic. As long as it fits into a SMART goal somewhere, you're golden. And I love the idea that for something where, where you've got a piece that takes a long time of doing nothing in the middle, like waiting yeah. for bread to rise, uh, that you, you tell them, go and do something else, come back in an hour. I would also yeah. imagine that the smell of fresh baking bread would draw in many, many people <laughs> who are interested, not just your own students. I'd be there. I'd they be want, there they the want the taste when you're done. But, but that's an important <laughs> aspect of that process is, yes, it takes three hours, but most mm -hmm. of those three hours, you're not three. I mean, when I was a kid, I used to say, watch the bowl, but, but um, <laughs> I have other things to do now. Right. 
Right. And, and honestly, people will appreciate and respect your respect for their time. Uh, when we get together in events in person, there's so much going on and we've got so many conflicting needs that, oh, I want to do this. I want to do this. I want to do this. Uh, yeah. Being able to have the choice of, do I want to watch the bread rise and sit here and chat with Tommaso <laughs> or do I want to go up and do I want to go and stab my friends out on the rapier field? Uh, that's an important thing. And you know, I, I also want to toss that out there. Um, it's a wonderful thing to teach classes. I have enjoyed this so, so very much through, through huge portions of my life. But respect your students. You are giving them a gift. They are giving you a tremendous gift of their time and attention. And we talk about this a lot in the Bardic Arts. You may have heard me go on about this in, in Bardic Circles 101, but it's just as important, if not more so, uh, in teaching. People are giving you their precious time, so give them something good. Uh, all right, any other questions before we leap into the next section? Uh, all right. All right, moving on. Uh, this is the first. Uh, th this is the first fun piece I've written for you. This is the worksheet. This is a template, a a page that's on the Google Drive uh, to help you organize your thoughts, to help pull things together, help you decide on which of the frameworks you want to use if you want to use a framework. Get yourself ready to write help plan out your timelines uh, and to organize your thoughts as far as what are the materials and props that you need. Uh, if you're going to be doing a hands-on class and you need scissors, do you need one set of scissors that you can share around with all the people or do you need scissors for each individual so they can progress at their own speed? Uh, these, are, these are things that you, you got to work out ahead of time. And uh, I, I have found myself in the unenviable position of doing a class and realizing after I had started the class, when I have everybody there in front of me and they're eager, they want to learn, they want to do the thing. And I have forgotten a really important tool or an important prop. So um, I will also recommend Sophie does a lot of improv classes and those have helped me a great deal. Be ready for those inevitable oopses to recover and just plain keep going. Uh, so improv is good. I recommend that if you're looking for other classes to take uh, here at, at Mid-Realm University, improv is a good one. Okay, so the worksheet, here's another really, really good piece. It's not linear. You can start it step by step by step, but as you go, you will probably find, as you're working your way from design to development, you'll probably find areas you need to adjust, things that you go, oh, you know, I thought we were going to do this, but I think I kind of got to do this instead, or this doesn't make sense if I don't mention that part first. I can talk about using a template, but if I don't explain what goals are, and especially what SMART goals are, you aren't going to know what to put in that section. So I got to go backwards in the worksheet and add some more stuff. So uh, for all of you nonlinear thinkers, go for it. You'll be very excited about this part. Um, this is a close up of what it will look like when you get into the file. The first part is uh, we, sorry, we follow the ADDI cycle that we talked about at the very beginning of the class. Analyze is our first step to come up with the big idea. What is it that you want to make your class about? Then the second part is design to set some parameters. Who, what, when, where, why? What resources do you have available? Are you going to do this on a Zoom class? Are you going to do this in the Big Tent of Penzik? Uh, is this going to be at a baronial meeting? Uh, is this going to be a couple of people get together in my living room? Uh, setting some parameters and then design the SMART goals, what we just talked about. And you'll notice that there's a little space in each of these. So this is a place to get started. If you need more space, I always have tons and tons of my uh, spiral bound notebooks around. Feel free to add, take up as much space as you want. These are writing prompts to get you started. This is not the be all end all. Okay, so out of Addy, 
the five steps we've got analyze design uh analyze di oh, i have another typo and nobody in the last class pointed this out okay we've got analyze design and it's supposed to be develop i've got the wrong thing here all right color my face red here's another thing that in my analysis of how to fix this class i've got two typos to track down all right so analyze design and we know it's supposed to be development uh then as part of development i would recommend to uh, i'm giving you the tools to pick a development framework now this is an interesting thing and this is something that is brand new that i have created just for the sca when looking at all the SCA classes that I've taken, the vast majority of them fall into about three different types. Um, I tried really hard to use the framework that we used in Girl Scouts called the experiential learning cycle. And if we have time at the end, I can actually share that. This is what uh, I taught at Penzik with, with the, the session where Anarad um, was, was there with us. Um, and it didn't go so well because it didn't really fit. It was a little too, um, a little too academic, a little too in depth for what people usually do with SCA classes. Uh, so I analyzed. I looked at a lot of the SCA classes that I was seeing at Penzik, at local events, at other things, and m my anecdotal understanding is that a lot of classes, vast majority, fit into one of these three types. Uh, the first one is a sequence of steps. This is good for make a thing or do a thing, such as this is how to fill out the paperwork at gate when you're when you're running gate for your local event. It's a sequence of steps. Or to borrow Tomasa's class, this is how you make bread. These are the things you put together. This is how long you bake it. This is this is how this is how you need it, and then you bake it after you've needed it. So having a sequence of steps, you break it down piece by piece into what has to what has to happen in each step. Uh, the second one is the big one across the bottom there. Tell me something. I used to I, I originally had this as tell me a story, but people pointed out, yeah, that's a little too bardic arts. They might think that this is specifically for storytelling. So this is tell me something. This is good for uh, sharing history, sharing information, or explaining why something works. So this would be fantastic for uh, explaining the importance of pilgrimage to religious groups in the Middle Ages. Um, I don't know how many of you might be uh, doing the, the pilgrimage that um, uh, the pilgrimage on Facebook, uh, walking 170 miles to I'm not Turkish, so I can't pronounce the name, but is the pilgrimage. So you don't have to do a series of steps with that. We're really telling what we know about it. Uh, now, the, uh, the framework that, the, sorry, the, the framework template I've created uh, helps wrap your brain, helps um, organize the thoughts so you have your specific points in a coherent order. That always makes for a good story, whether it's Bardic or otherwise, but if the point of your class is to share history, to share information, this is a good way of doing it. It doesn't have to be linear, but it should have a reasonable flow. Um, make sure they're in a good order, like any good story, make sure there's a beginning, middle, and end, and use evidence to give your story credibility. Uh, in the SCA, this is often uh, the magic word documentation, uh, which is the, the academic sounding word for, uh, did you make this up or do, do we have any evidence from history that this happened? So it might be, hey, I found a mosaic at Pompeii. So we're gonna talk about the importance of mosaics or, uh, well, if it was how to put a mosaic together, that would probably be more the sequence of steps than uh, than the tell me something. But those are the two plat the the two frameworks that I see most often. Uh, the third uh, framework that I added is panel discussion. This is something that I've seen quite a lot, and it may feel like it's easy just to throw a bunch of people together in a, an area and discuss the thing, uh, but 
it does help to have a facilitator who has some facilitating skills and to have some idea of what are the specific bullet points that you want to discuss, the questions you want to bring up, the answers that you are hoping come up within this. Uh, and remember how in SMART goals we talked about being specific? With a panel discussion, you definitely want to have some things in your back pocket, some tools, how to keep the discussion focused. Uh, within the Bardic Arts, we know that there are a lot of panel discussions where the minute you mention the key word of the day, we are off on tangent and probably a drinking game. So as a facilitator for a panel discussion, as a teacher, as someone designing the panel discussion, you want to be able to bring things back to stay focused on your specific topic. That's pretty much the most, that, that's one of the most critical pieces of what makes a good panel discussion versus not so great panel discussion. Uh, so those are the three frameworks. Uh, then on the back of the worksheet, uh, this is, hmm, you know, Maybe it's not a typo on the first page. Uh, okay, so, so this is further amounts of development, how to flesh out your design into an outline or script. Uh, and you know what? I will explain what you're seeing here a little bit more a little later. Uh, this, is, this gets into the adult learning theory. And then uh, we talked about timeliness timelines for the SMART goals. How long is each part going to take? How long is the whole class going to take? How long are each of the pieces going to take? Uh, it's important to add up the sections. It's really amazing how quickly the time flies when you're actually implementing, when you're actually doing the class. Uh, and it's a good idea as a teacher to have time to take questions from your students and make sure that if somebody's not, if, if one of the concept is, isn't clear. You have an opportunity to go back and fix it, to go back and reestablish it. So make sure to build time for that into your session design as well. Uh, and then there's a last big section here on what, reses, re, what resources and materials will I need. This is where you start making your list of, yes, I need a set of scissors for each person. I need four yards of yarn for each person. I need one clock or I need one template pattern for a thing. Uh, this is where you, you can collect everything that you need to have physically to make things go. Uh, and it's, it's always good to review this at least twice before you go and teach the class. Um, as when I was working with Girl Scouts, I live in Indianapolis, which is the center part of Indiana. But I would regularly teach in Lafayette, in Terre Haute, in Richmond, in Bloomington. I'd have to drive for an hour to an hour and a half to get to a lot of these class sites. Uh, and very often this was after regular working hours. So a lot of shopping places were closed and a lot of office places were closed. So if I didn't have something, I was kind of up a creek. Uh, it's always good to check your list, check your list, check your list. All right, moving forward, these are the framework templates. We have sequence of steps, we have tell me something, and we have panel discussion. Uh, these are three separate PDFs. Uh, as we've said, they are on the Google Drive that Sophie has so kindly posted. Uh, the first one, this is the sequence of steps. You'll notice up at the top, we start with the goal. This is where you put your SMART goal. And then we have step by step by step by step. This one has seven. You might use all seven. You might use more. You might use fewer. This is again where we talk about uh, it being not linear until you're ready to deliver it. As you're doing your design, you may discover, oh, you know, I've got steps one, two, and three, but then there's this other bit that I forgot that has to go in between one and two. So you grab your eraser and you put it wherever it is that you need it. Um, I also have boxes for tools, materials, and measurements. So that feeds into the box we were just talking about on the worksheet of what are the tools and props and pieces that you need. And you'll also see each step has a time chunk. Uh, if you only have an hour to teach class, and honestly, we schedule most classes in the SCA for an hour because it's a nice, 
it, it's a nice useful unit. It's an easy unit and we plan in a lot of units of an hour, but when you're teaching, you really only get 45 to 50 minutes because the first five minutes we're we've got people peeking in and going, oh, is is this the roundtable discussion? No, that's down the hallway. Uh, or with Zoom, trying to get people logged in, the first five minutes um, are not really going to be deep and valuable, uh, deep and valuable instructional time. Uh, and then something that we've discovered even on Zoom sessions. Uh, the last five or 10 minutes, you get a lot of people that are ready to go to the next session or people that want to grab you and ask a few specific questions about their specific case. Uh, so if you have an hour and you know you have to be out of the classroom in an hour, plan for 50 minutes so that you've got the leeway on both ends to get done what you need to get done. You're not over planning your, um, your uh, material. Uh, but also, as you're planning step by step, it really helps to know how much time you can take for each step. So plan it and be ready to adjust on the fly. That's why I have my nice little clock that is always here when I'm teaching so I can keep an eye on it and know how much time I've taken and how much time I still have left for the pieces I want. Um, okay, so while you're developing your sequence of steps, uh, the 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 trick I like to use is something I picked up some, from some programming friends. It's called rubber duck programming uh, or rubber duck debugging. And I just thought this was absolutely adorable. And anybody that's done programming will probably be giggling right now. Uh, apparently, when you run into a particularly sticky situation uh, and you can't figure out why your code is not working, uh, the tradition is you grab a rubber duck and very sincerely and very completely, you explain your code step by step, line by line to the rubber duck because the rubber duck does not assume anything. The rubber duck does not judge, which is also good, but the rubber duck is simply there to absorb the information. And if you are focusing on explaining everything in detail to your rubber duck, chances are you're going to break it down into enough steps that the little bugaboo the, the glitch in the programming will reveal itself. Uh, just like I was talking earlier about, wait a minute, I put design and design, maybe that should be developed. Um, <clears throat> when I was writing that, I wasn't focusing that directly on the words because I knew what I was saying. The rubber duck probably wouldn't know what I was saying, so I would be reading those to the rubber duck and that's where I would find my error. Uh, so. Feel free to grab a rubber duck, a teddy bear, a useful patient friend of yours, and explain your thing very carefully, step by step in, in little tiny pieces. And then from there, decide if you need to, to put some pieces together, um, or it's good just piece by piece by piece by piece. Uh, as I said, this is really, really great for making a thing, uh, such as making a book, or create, uh, creating a job aid for how to do a thing, uh, such as how to plan a feast or how to run gate is the one I usually do. How to run court, I'm sure uh, Baron Andreas, Baron Master Andreas uh, would have a lot of good information for, for something like that. But sequence of step, there's a start, there's piece, 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 and, and then at the end, we know what we've got. Uh, as a trainer, as, as the instructor, the person putting this together, I would highly recommend if you're making a thing, have examples for each of these steps to say, all right, we're going to start out by doing the first step. And at the end of the first step, it should look like this. Then you do the second step. At the end of the second step, it should look like this. So you'll have a lot of in-process pieces, in-process examples. Uh, if you can't have... Um, the actual physical pieces. Um, I know Sophie's beloved husband, Manus McDye, does a lot of classes on roses. It's tough to take those live to all the places that he teaches classes, but he can have pictures, he can have dried roses, he can have videos, he can have uh, diagrams, things to represent each of those individual steps. Uh, so, so that may be a way to work around that. <clears throat> Uh, step by step by step. Um, and there was something else I was going to say about the step by step. 
and unfortunately it has escaped me. So hopefully it'll come raise its head before the end of the class session. All right, so this is, this is the whole framework for sequence of steps. The next one is tell me something or create a story. So again, we start with the goal. By the end of the session, participants will. Uh, and then the, the, the example I like to use for this strategy is uh, my friend, Master Tonus, reminded me of the five paragraph essay that a lot of people do in English class in school. Uh, you start with paragraph one is, this is what I'm going to tell you. Uh, paragraph two is the first big point, then the second big point, then the third big point, and then you wrap it up with a tidy conclusion uh, that pulls all of it together. So this is a great way to approach sharing information or sharing history. Uh, so we start with tell them what you're going to tell them. This is the introduction. This is where you, you set your argument to the jury. Then you tell them the first point and you use, you do use evidence or things to support it. It might be stories. It might be artifacts. It might be letters. It might be references. Then you do it again with point two, then you do it again with point three, and then pull it together with a conclusion. Now, if your story, if the thing that you're trying to tell takes more than three points, then guess what? You can add them all in there. Add as many points as you need, but this way the worksheet fits on one single page. So we've got point one, point two, point three, add more as you need, but I still want everybody to wrap it up with a tidy conclusion down there, um, section five. Uh, and hopefully all the points that you have used in points one, two, and three will support the theory that you created in step one. Um, I also like, especially in this, since this is mostly discussion and sharing information, I absolutely recommend leave some time for questions and discussion at the end. Sometimes you might think you're making point one perfectly clear, but mm, it might not be. So this is the opportunity for someone to say, you know, I didn't quite get point one or gee, that, that looks like a nice piece of evidence, but what about this point over here? So it's also the opportunity to open it up for further discussion. This is where um, Skadians can share with each other and you come up with new knowledge that you might not have had before. Uh, okay, so that is template number two, tell me something. And then we come to template number three, the panel discussion worksheet. Um, the, uh, it starts with the SMART goal, like all the others. Uh, and then instead of the uh, point 0.1, point 0.2, point 0.3 from the tell me something template that we just had, we have panelists one and two and three. So these are people that you want to know why you've brought them together. What, uh, and that's why I put these, uh, the, the questions here in this particular framework worksheet. What do I want them to bring to the discussion? Do I have any points that I absolutely want them to make? Uh, Duchess Elena does very interesting panel discussions on women in combat. So if I were to have anything about women in combat, she would absolutely be one of the first people I would want on my panel to bring up those specific points. And then, depending on what my goals were, what my my what the point of my panel discussion is, I may want to bring in additional supporting viewpoints or opposing viewpoints, uh, specifically off of of the people that I've already chosen. Um, okay, so so we also start off with the facilitator at the very top because I'm assuming in most cases, if you're designing the panel discussion, you're going to be the facilitator. However, if you know those are not your strong points, those are not your strong facilitation skills, you may want to recruit someone else to be your MC, to be the facilitator. And you still have all of this design behind it. This is your big idea. This is what you are sharing, even if it's not you on stage. Um, okay, so panel discussion, we have the facilitator, we have the panelists. Introduction is important. Um, there are a lot of folks that will just start and say, hey, we've got interesting people and we're just going to dive in on the discussion. More often, 
Um, I like there to be some sort of introduction, some sort of getting everybody on the same page, because I may have spent hours and hours and weeks pondering this, so I may know why this is a good thing to talk about. I may know why I want to bring this up, but not everybody else does. And one of the beautiful things about SCA events is we usually have our classes in fairly open formats. So there may be somebody just wandering by and goes, huh, there's some interesting people in there. I kind of want to see what's up. So they may have no concept whatsoever of what this panel discussion is other than there's interesting people. So it's always a good idea to start with a proper introduction to get everybody on the uh, to get everybody on the same page. And if you've got a really hot topic and uh, honestly, with today's culture, um, there are a lot of hot topics out there. You may want to set some ground rules first. Uh, for instance, that questions will only be directed towards the facilitator or you or we are going to discuss this, this and this and we are not going to discuss that because that's for another time, another place, other people. Uh, so it's always better to set your ground rules for discussion ahead of time rather than to try and regain control once it's gone off the rails. Uh, like the other templates, we've got important question one, two, and three. If you need more, absolutely put them in. Uh, as the facilitator, you probably want to have an idea of how long you're going to devote to each question, because in the SCA, we like to talk. We like to talk an awful lot. So anytime you open the stage to get people to talk, they will probably fill it and fill it and fill it. So have, have your little clock have somebody being the referee, and as the facilitator, it's probably you, have someone be the referee to bring things back together, to stay on focus to our SMART goals, the specific, relevant, and measurable. Um, at the very end, uh, like with the other templates, I recommend a wrap up, a conclusion. It's always nice to say thank you to your panel discussion panelists. Uh, but also, it's a good idea to just tie a bow on it and say, you know, our conversation has meandered all around here, around here, and here are the important takeaways, or here are the most important points, or this is a really nice thing to ask your panelists. Um, I was just in a uh, panel discussion um, uh, on Zoom for, I think it was the ethereal bardic madness. Uh, and the facilitator asked each of the participants, because we were all participating, I think there were a total of nine of us, so it was manageable, um, asked each of the nine of us to share what's the most important thing that you got out of today's discussion. And that was a really nice, uh, that was a really nice rundown of the key bullet points that we we covered very widely. Uh, it was It was really interesting discussion. Uh, we covered a lot of topics and having that summary really put a nice ribbon on everything. Um, the last piece I want to mention is down at the bottom outside of the design. This is for the facilitator to be prepared. What pitfalls or derailments might come up? Um, this is something that the facilitator should think about. Uh, what do you know about the topic? What do you know about the hot spots that are already out there? But I would also absolutely check with your panelists of what do you think might run this off the rails? Uh, in the Bardic stuff, in, in Bardic topics, we often say, don't ever ask anyone to define what are the Bardic arts because there are so many jokes and so many memes about it. It does become the drinking game. So, Frank! <laughs> see? See? Told you. Uh, so, as a facilitator, I might warn my panelists, please do not even mention this question. And as a facilitator, I want to have something, this is where I go to Sophie's improv class, I want to have something in my back pocket, something prepared that if someone goes in that direction, I can pull them back and say, you know what, that's for a different class, we'll cover that tonight at, at the Thieves of Hearts camp because they've got the most alcohol. Uh, and, and that's how I bring it back, that's how I bring, bring the fat, ah. That's how I bring the focus back to the goal of this particular panel discussion. 
Okay, so that is our three different framework templates. That's a lot to throw at you. Does anybody have any questions on these? Um, I'm going to do the thing of, of look at the uh, pictures and see if anybody's waving. No? Ooh, ooh. This gives me hope. It looks like everybody's absorbed this. All right, and I will share with you, these are brand new. These are based out of what I've done in the past and kind of distilled down into SCA specific. So these have not been tested out in the wild a whole lot. So again, I, I repeat my invitation, please use these, please do stuff with these and let me know how it goes. If you want me to review your, your plan before you teach a class, I would be absolutely delighted to do this. Really seriously delighted. Um, Okay, and it looks like we're only at 8.05, so we've actually done better on time than I did at my, at my last session. Uh, and we get to go into uh, the bonus rounds of making it more effective. This is where I get to bring in some of my um, um, adult learning theory information. This is what I originally wanted to make the class about because I love adult learning theory. It's kind of like opening up someone's brain and looking inside and going, oh, that's how the pieces work. That's so cool. Who knew all of that was in there? Uh, but when I taught the class before, I was finding that I was spending too much time on all of this juicy 1970s theory and not getting to the practical hands-on stuff, which is what most people wanted. So now that we've covered the hands-on stuff, I can go into some of the, uh, some of the more uh, juicy brain bits. Uh, and I'm calling this making it more effective because these are pieces that it helps to have this in mind, but it's not absolutely critical. Uh, so the first section, you might have seen this in other things, uh, in, in other venues. Uh, I call this the pyramid of retention. This is how people take in information and what sticks with them. And you'll notice at the, at the very top of the pyramid, it's, it's pretty small. If someone lectures to you or lectures at you, generally people are going to remember about 5% of what is shared in the information. Um, this is why, uh, especially at Girl Scouts, we said, please, no talking heads. Talking heads are doomful because it's just me pontificating at you and about 5% of the stuff is gonna stick. So we really wanna do more things that, that help make it more sticky, more retention, that your students are going to take what you've learned and, and be able to keep it and use it in their lives. Uh, the next step down, reading. If, somebody, if you read something, you'll retain about 10% of it. Uh, if you've ever read the instructions on how to put together a set of Ikea shelves, you might remember about 10% of it once you're done, but really you don't need to remember that much. Uh, but if this is a class, we want people to remember more. However, if you start putting the pieces together, lecture plus reading, you're definitely gonna remember more than just one or the other. Um, audio visual, that's kind of what we've got going on here. We might have a movie to watch, or I don't remember how many of you were, were school kids in the 80s and, and had film strip day. Film strip day was great uh, because it was more than the teacher just lecturing at us and us reading the textbook. It was the next level. Um, demonstration, this is where someone is actually doing the thing. And, and I'm going to uh, jump in and say, I've seen Elizabeth do demonstrations of her Yay Beads classes. And that is so much fun because it's not just saying, when glass gets this hot, it, it fluoresces a red color. It's you see it actually turning cherry red and you tell your brain, that means don't touch. And at the different temperatures, it does different things. So watching her do that is so much more effective than even seeing just a video, uh, uh, an audiovisual video of the thing. Uh, next layer up is discussion group. This is where we start getting more people participating in it. More people have, um, have input. It's not just the students sitting there. Uh, this is why in a lot of my classes, I will try and divide people up into discussion groups or have entire group discussions about 
a thing. The more you make it interactive, the more the brain is actually doing something with the information at the time, and that's what makes it stick. Uh, practice by doing. Uh, this is where Elizabeth hands somebody a, a mandrel and a torch and some glass and says, now you try it. And oh my heavens, that really, really pumps up their attention to about 75%. You'll find that when you're in that situation, when you're doing the thing, you might feel, oh my gosh, I totally got this. And the next week when you try and do it at your own house, you'll realize that you've lost a step or two, but it's not the whole thing. You might lose a step or two and have to email Elizabeth and say, wait a minute, how did I get from the dremble to the kill? I know I'm missing a piece in here. Um, and then the, the bottom of our pyramid, the biggest chunk is immediate use or teach others. Um, I had a fabulous experience in, uh, uh, in, in December of this year. I met up with my family for Christmas, as we usually do. We went to the Outer Banks of North Carolina, and I got to go hang gliding. It was fabulous. And they have to teach you some really important things, like how to not crash, how to take off, how to land. And so we had some lectures, some demonstrations, some practice by doing, and then we actually did the thing. And oh my heavens, even then, I didn't remember everything because there was a lot of adrenaline going on. There was a lot of excitement, but being able to put that knowledge into immediate use really, really stuck in my brain. I was able to retain so much of, of what they discussed, what they told us, because I needed it right then. Um, most of the SCA stuff that we do isn't going to be quite so life or death critical, but for instance, Tommaso's bread making class, they're going to use it right then. They're going to do the whole thing. They're going to immediately use those skills. They're immediately going to start doing the kneading and putting it into the, uh, into the forms and sticking it in the oven and making sure to take it out before it jars to a crisp. <clears throat> Okay, so that is the pyramid of retention. As you're doing your design, keep in mind, you might not have the, the best resources. Right now, I would love to be doing this face-to-face -face with people, having a discussion group, having several hours so you can practice by doing, but we're a little limited because of the pandemic and because it's a Monday night. So yes, I'm using some of the things from the smaller part of the pyramid, but hopefully, uh, you'll have enough uh, that you can uh, go back and read the materials. You can talk with me later. We're adding some things to uh, up the retention factor. Uh, VAK. This is another fabulous piece about the way people perceive and understand information. This is three different pieces uh, that... Um, shoot, you know what? I don't have the reference. I forget who came up with this concept, but people will generally absorb and start processing information on one of three, um, uh, one of three senses. There's visual, the learners that process things by seeing. There's auditory, the, the learners who process things by hearing it. And then there's kinesthetic, the, the learners that process by, by picking the thing up and looking at it. So um, back with our um, pyramid of retention, uh, the people that have something to read, uh, that specifically goes to support the visual learners who want to see something. Lecture supports the auditory learners, the learners that want to hear things. Uh, and then the kinesthetic learners, they are happiest when you've got a demonstration, when I have my own set of knitting needles and I get to do a thing. Um, so when you're designing your class, uh, this is why I added it to the worksheet. <clears throat> I would highly recommend make sure you've got something for each of your different groups of learners. Try and make sure that there is something that they can look at, something they can listen to, and something they can get their hands on. Um, we haven't been able to do it here so much. I've got a lot of visual and I've got a lot of auditory. Haven't got a whole lot of kinesthetic because it's very difficult to reach through Zoom and hand you things. But that's one of the reasons why I have so many of these things 
available on the Google Drive so that hopefully, even though it's outside the timeline of our class, uh, it's something that you can print out, you can grab a pen and you can fill out, you can do your own piece. And writing is definitely a kinesthetic, uh, a kinesthetic um, element. So that's VAK and that's why I included it on the back of the worksheet. Uh, stay on target. This is another thing with the focus. As you are pulling your class information together, there will be pieces that are absolutely critical to know, things that are good to know, things that, that you need to know, and things that are just plain nice to know. So as you are working on your design, make sure that you know which pieces are which and try to focus on the most critical. Um, I always design my classes. This is this is a little more advanced of a technique, but um, I know I'm always going to run out of my out of time in my classes. So I make sure I know which parts of my classes are the nice to know, not the critical to know. So if I'm running short on time, those are the ones that get chopped out first. So that might be the second or third round of an activity, or that might be let's break into groups and do a thing, or that might be hey, let me tell you about my credentials as to why this class is, is, why this class came to be. It might be nice to know, but it's not critical. And if I have to choose between explaining SMART goals and explaining why I'm teaching this class, the why I'm teaching the class is the first thing to go. So this bullseye should help you uh, stay on target, to stay focused on what's the most relevant, uh, what's the most specific part of your class that you absolutely want to make sure that your your participants get. Um, also, and this was a little tough for me to wrap my brain around, um, structure your flow so that the most critical stuff is the first. You will find in the SCA, there's a lot of people that can't stay for the whole session or they have an emergency or something come up. So. Uh, that's one of the things I did with this session is uh, with this class design is I focused on getting the uh, the Addy cycle and the smart goals as the very first pieces and then the explaining the worksheets as the next section because those worksheets are available on the Google Drive. If someone absolutely needs to go, they can pick up how to use those worksheets because I've added enough information in there that hopefully they're intuitive and self-explanatory. So that's, that's part of the need to know circle. It's not part of the critical to know circle. If you know that it's on the Google Drive, that's the critical point. And then they can go to the Google Drive and pick up what the, the remainder of, of what they need. Um, and if, the, if they missed me talking about Girl Scouts, that's fine. That's a nice to know. That helps with, that helps with group development, which is another topic entirely, uh, but it helps make it relatable. And it also uses up a few minutes in the beginning where it's nice information, but we're waiting for more people to show up, the ones who are having trouble getting their Zoom to connect. Uh, so this is useful information. This is not just sitting here twiddling our thumbs. It's the nice to know information that if somebody has missed, they're not gonna be really lost in, in the flow of the class. Um, Bloom's Taxonomy. This I remember talking about in, um, in uh, English class in, in high school. Uh, this is a series of how, how to understand. Uh, and you can, you can Google this and find lots and lots and lots of information. But when th the reason I brought this is that we work from the bottom of the pyramid up, and this is great for helping design those SMART goals of how far do you want people to go. The bottom of the pyramid, the first level we hit is remember that if I've said something and then we talk about it a couple days later, you might go, oh, I remember hearing about that. You might not be able to repeat back what the five steps of Addy are, but my hope is that from this class, you will at least remember. You'll know that it's a development cycle. You'll know that there's five parts. If somebody puts those five parts in front of you, you can say, oh, I remember that. I have seen this before. I recognize it. The next level up is understanding. So 
hopefully from the class today, you understand what Addy is for. You understand what SMART goals are for. You, you have this in your brain in a place where you can use it. The next step up is apply. You actually do the using of it. You implement a SMART goal. You use one of the templates to write your own class. Um, analyze and evaluate. These actually tie in a bit to our ADDI cycle. This is where you can look at what you've already done and decide, does it meet the criteria? Does it meet the framework? Have I achieved the thing? Um, evaluate, uh, is this a good thing? Here, we've got, we've got 16 examples of Welsh Renaissance poetry. Which ones are good? Which ones are bad? Which ones don't actually need, which ones don't actually use congwyneth and would have you banned from the table? Uh, and then at the very top, create. Uh, sometimes they call this synthesis. This is where you take everything that you've learned in the previous steps and you make your own thing. Uh, so when you guys all go out and use the templates, use the framework, uh, design your session, you are creating your very own class. That is the top of the pyramid, and I am so happy for you to achieve that top of the pyramid. Uh, so if you want to get into Bloom's Taxonomy further, there are people that have written like doctoral dissertations on this. And there are some alternate taxonomies out there. Um, I believe Gagne and Briggs is the one that uh, supplants bloom when you get into the higher levels of academia. Um, but if you're really, really interested in that level of adult learning theory, come by my camp. I've got beer and cider and we can geek out for hours. Um, Okay, Malcolm Nowell's The Philosophy of Adult Education. This is where things get a little different from um, educating kids. Uh, my Aunt Meg used to teach math and uh, trying to convince fifth graders why they need to know the quadratic equation was a bit challenging because it's on the syllabus, it's on the, it, it's on the calendar, it has to be taught, they are supposed to learn it, but they didn't give her any specific reasons why the kids have to learn it, except that it feeds into other mathematical, uh, uh, other mathematical theories, other mathematical pieces later on. Um, so a lot of times kids just have to take what we're feeding them in school because someone else has decided you need to learn adverbs. You need to learn the quadratic equation. You need to learn the reasons why we had the Civil War in, 1960, in 1862. Uh, and as an adult, I'm finding some of those are actually wrong. But that's another class. That's another uh, opportunity for debate. Uh, Malcolm Knowles is uh, a, a person that did a lot with the philosophy of adult education. And he came up with four elements that are consistent among adult learners. Uh, first off, in the blue, they are lifetime learners. We don't stop learning just because we graduated from high school or college or wherever we got to the end point and they said, hey, you're done. Here's your piece of paper. Go away. Uh, and I think in the SCA, we have even more of this because people come to this organization because they like to learn. They're interested in a thing and they want to find out more. And the more they find out, the more they find out they're interested in another thing. And that leads to another thing. Uh, so we learn all our lives long. We learn because we're interested in it. Uh, part two in that uh, purple section is unique experiences. Each one of us adults has this long history of things we've tried, things we've done. Um, I mentioned my, my history with the Girl Scouts. Um, I am certainly not the only person to show up to one of these classes who has a background in teaching. We all come from different histories. We all have unique experiences that we bring to this. Uh, in the orange section, real life applications. Generally, adult learners want to do something with what you're teaching them. Uh, this is why a lot of SCA classes are the demonstration things, how to make a book, how to draft a pattern, how to bake bread, how to make glass beads, how to run an event, 
uh, how to set up an event online. Uh, they, they want to do things in real life. The quadratic equation, that's going to be a hard sell, but how to make a book is going to be very popular. Uh, right now, uh, well, as of last summer, uh, the Midrealm has a, uh, uh, the Midrealm has been very, very excited about, um, uh, oh, I forget the word for it, um, die making, uh, making coins, stamping. I think there's a better word for it, and it totally escapes me at the moment. But uh, minting, there we go, minting coins that you can create, you can carve your own die and put it in a thing and and put a put a blank and smash it and put your own design on things that are not real money but have an incredible coolness factor for the SCA. So lots and lots of people have been very excited about it. It's taken off like wildfire. So all of the classes that I've seen about here's how to make your own die, here's how to mint coins, have been very well attended, very enthusiastically um, uh, filled up, because this is a real life application. Someone wants to, someone saw this, said, hey, that's me, I want to know how to do that, and then they go and do it. Um, and then uh, part number four in the green is goal-oriented. Uh, generally, People, uh, adults, have an idea of what they're trying to do and why they are coming to your class specifically. Um, I'm kind of hoping that a lot of people that showed up tonight and a lot of people that showed up last week at University of Atlantia have a goal of they want to teach something, they want to share something. And so here, my class is going to give you the tools to reach that goal. Uh, it's real life applications, they go hand in hand. So uh, as you're designing your class, keeping these pieces in mind will help make it more effective to reach your adult learners. Uh, that's, that's why I wanted to share these. Um, we, we use these all the time in, in Girl Scouts. Uh, and as we were reviewing classes, we wanted to make sure, okay, do we have the real life applications? Do we know what the goals are out of this class? So that people who are looking for a class to meet their goals know that this is the one that they get to use. This is the piece that's here for them to do their thing. Uh, okay, and voila, we have come to the end of my juicy uh, adult learning theory stuff. This is, uh, I, I'm on Facebook. Actually, I haven't been on Facebook a lot this week because current events have been rather tragic. Uh, but I am on Facebook. I'm easy to reach on Facebook. I'm under my SCA name, so you can find me as Lucia Elena Braganza. Uh, and this is my email. This is my real, true, actual get me anytime email. Um, I don't check it nearly as much as I do on Facebook, uh, but I do check it at least once a week. So um, as I've said many times, please, please, please keep in touch. Um, if you have questions, email me or ping me on Facebook. Uh, if you want me to review something, if you need more in-depth information about something, I would love to help. I really enjoy geeking out about this stuff. And I'm super excited to see that we've got people willing to come on a Monday night and, and listen to me talk about this stuff. Uh, so yes, from here, make sure you get the Google Drive information out of the chat that, uh, that Sophie posted. Uh, it's got all the slide, uh, a PDF with all of the slides from the PowerPoint. It's got the worksheet that we talked about at the beginning. It's got the three frameworks. And it also has examples of classes that I've designed using those particular frameworks. So it's something you can look at and say, all right, she was talking about the sequence of steps. I'm, I'm not sure I get it. You can have an example right there to compare. Uh, it's kind of like tracing when you're first doing uh, calligraphy and illumination. I believe in tracing. Tracing is a good thing. So here's the way to. Uh, Here's the way to do that. And you know what? We've actually got a lot of time. So um, if anybody has questions or wants to talk about um, specific stuff, I, I am here for you. Uh, let me take a look and see if um, I know there's a chat. And usually Sophie's been the one to run the chat for me. 
Um, let me take a look and see if we've got anything there. And um, as we've said, I think I saw Tomasa waving. We'll, we'll use that because that works. If you've got a question or something you want to talk about, wave and, and we'll unmute you or you can unmute yourself. How do you find the diversity of abilities in the Girl Scouts compared to the diversity of abilities in the SCA? Ah, excellent, excellent question. And you know what? I My face is suddenly turning red because I had that on the worksheet and I do not have a slide about it, so I forgot to talk about it. Um, in Girl Scouts, uh, we have from the national level, uh, top down commitment to um, diversity uh, for culture, ability, a whole bunch of things. Uh, generally, I, I have found the Girl Scouts to be a lot more uh, achieving that than the SCA does right now. The SCA means well, and mm -hmm. we've got a lot of lessons to learn in large part because it's a volunteer organization. We don't have that same top-down hierarchy structure that the Girl Scouts do. Uh, we don't have nearly so many things that say, if you want to do X, then you must do Y. Um, so things like um, mobility accessible sites uh, have really only become a hot topic in the last couple of years. Um, and that's a huge problem. So yes, yes it as is. As we get older. <laughs> and you know what? This would make a fantastic panel discussion. This could go on for days and days. But uh, thank you for bringing up that point because I did want to mention uh, back in, let's see if I can scoot back to the workshop, sorry, worksheet. Here we go, here we go. Um, I mentioned we've got visual, auditory, kinesthetic. There's also, have I reviewed this for diversity, equity, and inclusion? Um, this is something that I'm adding now because I believe it is important. At the very least, review your own language. Are we using stories that involve um, oppression, that involve language that can be problematic? Um, do we have a way to, to fix that, to approach it differently, to approach our own thinking differently because we are leaders. If we are teaching, we can teach many things. I can teach you how to make a book, but I can also teach you to be a little more accepting of other people. So if I were teaching something like how to make a book, uh, to include to include things like, um, what if somebody doesn't have the physical strength to do step two? What am I going to do to make sure that that person still feels included, that can still go through that whole sequence of steps? Yeah, um, that comes up with Brad. You can't need, there's certain arthritic conditions that, oh, you can't need. Oh. And that, that comes up. Right, right. Um, okay, so so my question, what, what do you do in that case? Do you, do you have a partner? Um. <laughs> Uh, Beatrice is currently with, has bum knees and bum shoulders, so she's a really good oh. model uh -huh. <laughs> uh, in, until she has the next set of surgeries. Um, she's a good model for, hey, hey, this is going to be a problem. Is there a way to adapt it? Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it's possible, sometimes it's not. Um, if you're... You know, if you're if you're doing Middle Eastern drumming, there's a lot of techniques that require individual think individual finger as well as a lot of wrist mobility. Oh. And and that can be a thing. Um, mm -hmm. it, ha it hasn't come up yet, but you know, I'm aware. Hey, I can't play for four hours if I'm not really really conscious about my technique. Ouch. <laughs> At the that, beginning that's tough of the even night. for the able-bodied. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and, and if, of course, I, that's not going to get any better. Um, eventually, I'll be dragging 60, not just pushing it. Um, <laughs> um, comes up in bread. Um, it doesn't come up. It, you know, there, there's some areas where it comes up, like I did sourdough, and I'm passing around bowls of cultures at various stages of development, and uh, one man in the class couldn't smell. Oh, so you know, oh, this one really stinks, and he's, you know, everybody's, everybody else in the class, you know, the, the, the you know, delightful expression you expect, but that that's stuff that 
and that's stuff you're not going to think about because who who thinks about smelling equity? Good point. Um, Good point. But, it, but you know, I'd I'd also I'd also look at it, the, it at it in the framework of is this critical need to know yeah. need to know or nice to know i would actually say that smelling the different cultures is is nice to know i think that's a great example because that's going to hit our brainstem that's going to be something that the people who can smell will the reason it's that deep well, for the for the yeast it's important because three days in it really stinks and you sniff ah. it and you wonder if things have really gone around the bed and you should throw it out and try again very true that is part of the critical need to know yeah, uh, exactly. information. So yeah, as as the instructor, you may have to ponder on this a while and and find out. All right, what what other ways can people use to to decide whether or not the stuff's gone off? Yeah, very interesting. Thank you for bringing that up. I do appreciate that. Uh, Votes and, for self government, <laughs> especially in. Um, we, we have a fantastic new uh, DEI department, and um, I believe it's Jessica Van Hatten is uh, our minister of DEI. Uh, so I would say, I, I would say use them, use them, use their knowledge. Uh, tell them, hey, I'm developing this class. Do you see any pitfalls, anything I've missed? Uh, let's normalize this. Um, Myself, when I was designing this class, um, I had two different groups of like eight people that I, I test ran this class with to get their opinions. Uh, so by all means, when you're developing the class, going from that design to the actual thing, when you're developing the class, uh, use use resources that are out there. It's always valuable to have something outside myself to give me perspectives that I can't necessarily see. Um, yeah, okay, so so excellent point, Tommaso. Thank you for bringing me back to that. Um, I'm going to take a peek. Sophie, did you look at the chat? Were there any? Yeah, there's a great topic here. About? Yeah, there's a great topic here from Dawn, who'd like to talk about translating in-person classes to online delivery. Oh, my heavens. Like you, you just did. <laughs> you just did it. You're a great model. Absolutely fabulous. Yes, it is a bit challenging because Zoom is not real life. Zoom is not face to face. And it's been a challenge for me, if nothing else, just to look directly at the camera instead of being staring over here and see my face. And, <laughs> and it doesn't look like I'm looking at you. Now I'm looking at you. Now I'm looking at me. Now I'm looking at you. Um, I would actually say there are a couple of classes out there and sophie w did you teach one was there one for university of atlantia okay there yeah. are some resources out there Z converting from face to face to online is challenging enough i would actually say seek specific resources on that um at the very least the too long don't read that is prepare yourself to be talking to a little tiny plastic lens, not real people. It's a little unnerving, especially if you're not used to doing this. I've taught face-to-face -face classes for nearly 20 years, and it's difficult for me to make the switch. Um, learn the learn the platform. I have had an extreme blessing of having Sophie, who does this stuff professionally. She knows all the ins and outs. So she's been able to monitor the chat, make sure that my slides are in the right place, do the um, uh, mute and unmute people. She can do all of those things that um, never come up in a face-to-face. -face. I don't have to unmute anyone in a classroom setting because you're just sitting there. Uh, next piece is to make your, uh, make your materials in formats that can be shared. Uh, and don't count on people having them there physically uh, in their hands. This is why we have been using the um, we've been using the Google Drive with all the PDFs. PDFs are easy to share, easier to share than Word files or other proprietary formats because PDF is designed to be universal. It's designed so that anybody online 
can read these, use these, print these, and not necessarily edit them, which is another whole, um, uh, another whole area. Uh, and then I also highly recommend um, having having things like slides, having these here. Going back to our, let's see, the audio visual. Take pictures. Use the use the miracle of online internet stuff. Pull in as many visual things as you can, demonstrations. Um, me just talking at you gets boring and a little um, a, a little unnerving after a while. I do not like the talking heads. And there's a lot of people that do not like the look of themselves on, on, on video. So if I can put up a pretty chart like this and have you look at that instead, I'm going to be much happier. Uh, so those are those are my key points for um, for putting it on Zoom instead. And uh, it sounds it looks like Sophie's got a comment. Yeah, I'd love to hear Elizabeth too. Um, but I got a couple of just quick and easy tips, pro tips for moving your stuff to online. Yes. <laughs> uh, and yeah, I, I do online learning uh, for a job, a day job where they pay me money. So um, you know, I know a little bit about it. Um, the, the things that online learning needs that uh, in classroom stuff doesn't need as much is a focused method of interaction. So when you're in the classroom and you're looking at somebody, uh, you, can, you, can, you can get an idea of what the classroom is experiencing because of body language and what you're seeing and being in person. So uh, online, find ways to manufacture that. Um, and the chat box is my favorite. Uh, and also making more of an effort to stop and ask questions and, and dig in, you know, ask them, so really, what are you thinking of doing? Ask your students to think of something and put it in the chat box or take a minute and ask them to speak with their microphone, unmute themselves and show themselves on the camera. And I know some people get a little unnerved about seeing themselves on the camera and it's a new, it's another level of interacting. So when you're moving things online, think about more ways that you can encourage the interaction to happen uh, because that's what you're missing in, uh, you know, between real life classrooms and then here on uh, these things. Also another really good pro tip, uh, like my sister said, get yourself a TA. Uh, somebody who's going to be running the tech for you. Uh, in University of Atlantia, we, we discovered that the first round we did in June of an online university session, we found that that was like a key piece. And so the second session that we ran online, which just happened like 10 days ago, um, we made a real concerted effort to train people and ask them, uh, at, train people to be TAs where they're just running the tech. They're just um, welcoming people into the room, checking names, monitoring the chat box, monitoring the microphones, and um, and uh, like what I was doing for my sister during the Atlantia version of this class was I was running the slides and bringing up the uh, the documents and and that, and the tech stuff so that the actual teacher like my sister here could just focus on the content and dealing with the people. So that was a real lesson learned from Atlantia University, and I think we've made some really good progress with that. So I would recommend those two things. Pro tips force the interaction to happen, make more of an effort to interact with people, and get yourself a handy TA. Um, those are my, my uh, recommendations for now. <laughs> Excellent. And yeah. uh, I, I want to go to Elizabeth because she had some comments too. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to repeat some of what you said, but the other thing I've done is just what of my classes do I feel like when I'm teaching in person at an event, can I not do certain things? Oh, yeah. Mm. Like, Use it to like, advantage. like with pattern oasters, you know, there's so many images of artifacts that people haven't seen. I specifically have picked which classes I teach by where can I show lots of pictures and I can actually put up the picture and we can all look at the same thing and I can say, okay, now look at this point on your screen. You can see my cursor. Let's examine this. So take advantage of what the medium does well, which is you can share those visual things. And 
it's allowed me to do certain kinds of classes in what I think is probably even a much more exciting way. There's other things that I've specifically selected not to do because mm -hmm. I don't feel like they will translate as well to the online format, at least right now. Uh, so my biggest thing has been I've really tailored what I choose to teach based on where using an electronic format can add value. I've also found that on my, even when I have people, you know, turn on their cameras, turn on their mics, I get more conversation at the end of online classes. Like people get more comfortable with me through the whole thing. And then at the end, I start getting more responses and more questions. So leaving that time for that has been a learning process. Hallelujah, Elizabeth, sing it sister. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I just super love your point about use the electronic version of teaching to your advantage. Uh, you know, some classes translate great to being online. Some of them are just ah, awkward, you know, like sewing classes. I took a class from Drea Lead at some Atlanta University last year where she was teaching how to measure things and, and make like a, a measuring tape that would make a pattern. And it was all very, very hands on. And I don't think I could I don't think I could do that on um, I don't think I, that could be happening on Zoom. Uh, but, you know, some cooking classes are just fine. You know, they have cooking shows on TV, so they can translate really well onto a Zoom um, or any other kind of online sharing uh, collaboration platform. There's a lot of them out there, not just Zoom. Uh, so, yeah, uh, Elizabeth, thank you so much for making that point. That, that is super awesome. And um, I'd like to know, can you give us a couple more examples of those, choice, those choices you've made about the kinds of classes that do translate well and the ones that you've said, nah, not so much? Um, like I said, artifacts, um, I do pattern oasters. So being able to actually put up a picture of here is your artifact. Uh, I do a class on skulls and skeletons in prayer beads. So that's totally a visual class. So when I do it at Penzik, I have to pass out these handouts and sometimes you go, oh, hey, this image didn't print so well. I can't show it to you in color because I can't afford that kind of printing. So I've made those kind of choices mm. of, okay, here, where are the things where I want to share a visual? Mm. I did try one where I actually did a hands-on where I pointed the camera down at my hands working. Mm -hmm. That uh, people enjoyed it, but I did feel like it wasn't as successful for me. Beads mm. aren't that interesting to watch. Ah, but I took on a little a, bead one at a time. That can be kind of slow. Yeah. But I took a stained glass class where somebody was demonstrating and that worked beautifully. Wow. Because they had a camera where you could actually see them. You know, here's how I cut. And they had exactly what you said earlier. They had pieces staged at each point. <sighs> so they had their work area set up so that they said, okay, now I'm going to show you how to do this part. And they had two cameras so they could interact visually you know, with facial expressions. And then they say, okay, we're going to go to this camera and you're going to watch my hands. Oh, wow. That's great. Just like the cooking show style. Yeah. Just like a and, cooking and, show. And my aha moment is that was the piece that I had forgotten when I was talking about the sequence of steps is have those intermediate pieces. I love watching cooking shows on PBS and they'll say, okay, here, we're going to mix all these things together and we're going to put it in the freezer for an hour but they don't wait an hour. They grab yeah. out the second bowl that's been there chilling and it's ready to go. And they say, okay, and then we're gonna, we're gonna do this to all 15 of these items. And they've got a separate tray where I did my first one, we switched trays and now all 15 are done. So thank you. That was gonna drive me nuts. And, and yeah, it's the discussion classes are the ones that I have really struggled with. It seems like there is a size where you can still have a reasonable discussion on Zoom. But if it gets too big, 
you can tell the conversation just doesn't flow mm -hmm. and people aren't getting their opportunity necessarily to speak the same way. So I've had some that have worked, but it really, once it got to a certain number of people, you could tell that people felt like they weren't really getting the flow of the conversation. If you've got a good facilitator, you can make it work with larger groups, but you're going to be artificially uh, affecting the ebb and flow of the conversation that way. Like the peer dependent, the, the peerage roundtable that I ran yesterday, I had to say, okay, we're going to stop talking about this now, even though people would really like to keep going because we have other topics that we have to cover. We have other questions, that kind of thing. So we had to, a, a facilitator can make it feel like it's not like completely chaotic, but you're still going to be affecting the, the way the class or the way the discussion goes. Um, Lucia, I just want to draw your attention. Uh, Darifa has her hand up. I, she's asked some questions in the chat. I wanted to make sure you'd seen them. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. No, I had not seen that. Let me go over there. Da, 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 da. All right. Let me see. Okay. Darifa, I've been teaching a lot of classes online, focused more on theory and research. No, 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 further the, down. Further down? Yeah. Um, ah, okay. Called, does anybody have resources to learn better skills regarding classroom management? Classroom. I've been in a lot of classes where that's an issue. I know I haven't felt like it's been super challenging for me, but I know it's an area that could use improvement. Uh, excellent question. Excellent question. Um, I would actually put that under um, platform skills, presentation skills as a teacher. Uh, there's an entire uh, an entire different curriculum about that, uh, but for you specifically, um, go ahead and email me your email address. Um, I have some resources from um, from back in my Girl Scout days that might be helpful. Uh, one of them is recognizing and addressing challenging students, because we get that a lot in um, we get that a lot in the SCA. Imagine that people want to people want to add their two cents in, and some of them are so devoted to their two cents, five cents, dollar fifty. Uh, yeah, um, I've I've had that experience a lot. That when someone who believes they know more than me wants to take over my class, or someone who's simply being playing devil's advocate. Uh, sometimes one of the easy ways to head that off at the pass is to uh, is to um, set things up in the beginning, in the housekeeping, when you're introducing the class, saying, hi, my name is thus and such. Uh, we, we don't have this so much at Pensick classes or SCA classes, but this is always the introduction to my Girl Scout classes is, hi, thank you for coming. Please make sure you've signed in on the roster. Bathrooms are over there. If you need to take a cell phone call, please take it out in the hallway so we can continue the class here. Uh, and one of the ones I would always put up is if you have a question that's very specific, that's not for the whole class, here's a board where we're going to put up a bunch of sticky notes we can put it in the parking lot and so i as the facilitator had the ultimate decision of what we talk about in class versus what happened what goes to the parking lot and so if you've got somebody that's trying to take over i might try and find a way to wrap that up as gee that's interesting and you know what let's put let's put class management techniques in the parking lot and either we'll get to it at the end of class or you and I can have a conversation afterwards. Um, this it's it's a very, very important skill set. It's not something that we can address like in five minutes. I, I want to give you more more tools, uh, but setting expectations is is definitely a first thing to um, a first thing to use. Um, if you want to be sneaky about it, you can also bring a buddy um, if you've got a friend who's willing to sit there in the class and be willing to pounce on the people that are trying to derail it. Um, more power to you. Um, I have Sophie. Sophie can wrench the conversation from anyone else and hand it right back to me. <laughs> and as participants, um, this is something I try to be very aware of is I may have a lot to say, but this is 
that person's class. This is someone else's class. I'm not going to take over. I don't want to embarrass them while they're on stage, while they're doing their thing. I might go and discuss with them afterwards and say, you know, the internet wasn't invented by the time of the death of Elizabeth, so she probably didn't have Zoom calls with her lovers. And let's talk about some of these. Uh, it's, it's courtesy and respect. Um, oh, excellent point from Elizabeth. When I teach about recruiting and retaining volunteers, I set expectations that we are not going to spend time on stories of bad volunteering. Oh, good heavens, yes because we have a lot of people that like to complain and there's a certain amount of, I want to validate people and I want to promise we are not going to have that same bad experience again, but we may need to limit it because there's other pieces in my nice outline that we absolutely want to get to. And this is another great opportunity to say, Hey, come by my camp about sunset. I've got beer and lemonade and, and we can catch and catch. <laughs> and catch. But if it's got a point of, this is what happened in my class, how do I stop that from happening? That That's a relevant piece because it's an example. It's it's not just the complaining. So excellent, Elizabeth. I, I think I may need to steal that and, and add that to my outline. <laughs> I think Elizabeth is going to be my new best friend. Woohoo! <laughs> All right. It is 8.54 by my big clock. Uh, I have a thing I need to go do at nine. So I'm, I'm gonna call this done. Thank you so much. I really appreciate all the input. I appreciate everybody being here. And, and just to pound it home one more time, I'm really, really looking forward to having you guys use these tools. Tell me about it, ask me about it. It's collaboration. Go forth and be awesome. Thank you very much.